I think it's very clear that Trump, as well as the US administration, seems to have completely misread what North Korea was looking for in the summit. I think they had clearly established they had nuclear weapons. They had also shown that they have the hydrogen bomb, which certainly makes it possible to miniaturize the nuclear weapons and also a delivery system which could hit the mainland of the United States. Having done that, they, fought, they thought that they had now reached a position from which they could discuss with the United States how to reach a just peace in Korea's. And this is really the North and South Korea, which even till today have what is called a line of actual control, dividing them, which is essentially a line of control and it does not have even a ceasefire in it. it. What it has is a temporary cessation of hostilities, or which is called armistice. So in that sense, North Korea was looking for a longer uh, process in which they could achieve what they thought as security for North Korea. Uh, they had lost 20% of their people in the Korean War, and they have been under various kinds of military threat for quite some time. They thought this would lead to a kind of peace discussion, negotiations, and finally something which is just not armistice but really peace. What the United States read into this seems to be that it is a surrender and North Korea was therefore going to lay down all its nuclear weapons, its, uh, uh, shall we say, its uh, missile capabilities, would dismantle all of it and would then be at the mercy of the United States. And then United States could magnanimously give them certain benefits of having done this or could take it apart. Now, North Korea would have been very stupid if they laid down all their arms before any treaty or any agreement was reached. But that's what Bolton, Pompeo, as well as Pence, all three of them demanded. And it was also uh, Trump which started, started talking about this, of this as well. What they always have been talking about is Libya, how Libya was disarmed. It gave up its nuclear weapons program. It really never had nuclear weapons program. It had bits and pieces of technology which they had gathered from different places. It was not really any weapons program that they had. But having even given up that, uh, Libya was, uh, they, they gave, up this, gave this up I think in 2002 or 2001. And then subsequently in 2011, as you all know, uh, Gaddafi was killed as a part of regime change operations by the NATO powers. So if that is the example headed, given to Kim Il-jung, it would be very stupid on any North Korean leadership to actually give up its nuclear weapons in any summit. And that's what the North Korean leadership kept on saying, that don't talk about Gaddafi, don't talk about denuclearizing before, before we reach any peace agreement. Do not talk about unilaterally giving up all, all our arms and uh, you know, uh, disarming ourselves before you even talk about anything else. So this is something which I don't think the United States uh, heard. And when this was repeated again and again in response to the Gaddafi kind of uh, examples and Trump himself said, no, no, not the denuclearization example, uh, but the Gaddafi example is true if they don't agree to our demands, which means that we can then kill him. Now, you know, uh, to threaten a president of a country which has nuclear weapons and missiles that he will be quote unquote converted to a Gaddafi before a negotiations, only the United States leadership could be stupid enough to think that that would work. So I think either we decide that they were completely misreading the scenario or they had no serious intention of reaching this any agreement and this therefore was a kind of grandstanding gesture which now Trump has pulled out of. I think it's a jury would be out on that, what is it? But nevertheless, I think it's very clear, the United States expectations in the summit were very different from North Korea. And unless there is some pre-work that is done before such a summit, such a summit would end in failure. So in one sense, I'm relieved that Trump has pulled out of the summit before, you know, going there 
making these demands and ending in a, in a much more bitter failure of the summit. So in that sense, it's perhaps better that he has pulled out. But nevertheless, the consequence of this is that we, see, we still see a threat in, in, in what's going to happen in the Korean Peninsula. One must not forget, Trump has just pulled out of an agreement with Iran. And if the United States cannot keep any agreement, which seems to be the pattern which has developed since the last 20 years, then how seriously Kim can take this summit and any agreement that's reached out of it is an open question. But I would say that it brings us back to a confrontation and mode in the Korean Peninsula. But at the same time, it is also true that if this were the expectations on both sides, this would have the outcome of the summit would have also led to this. One thing we must understand that the summit that was proposed really came out of the two Koreas reaching some kind of peace understanding among themselves. The North Korean president and the South Korean president have met in what was considered in the Korean Peninsula to be a very, very important event. A North Korean president was vilified in South Korea before this event. Now he seems to have a very high uh, degree of approval as well. Of course, the South Korean president's also popularity has soared. So we do think, or I do think, that it is true that the initiation of this peace process was by the two Koreas and not really by the United States or other powers. So to that extent, what will be the impact of Trump's decision on the two Koreas coming together remains to be seen. I am hopeful that South Korea, if it takes a forthright position and continues with the peace process, while it does not have the ability to reach a conclusion of the peace process without the United States, but it can help to finesse, as it were, the United States and makes it much more difficult for the United States to ratchet up, shall we say, the war pressure. Beating of the war drums can take place, but really brinkmanship of a military kind without South Korean support may be difficult. So we'll have to see how South and North Korea play in this, in this, uh, in this juncture. The other thing that we need to also think about is that North Korea is surrounded on one side by South Korea, of course, we know that, but also by China and Russia. So they are an equal stake in the issue of United States using weapons, including nuclear weapons against North Korea, because all three are going to be affected, of course, South Korea more than anybody else, any other country, but even China and uh, Russia are going to be affected. So we need to see what the two Koreas, China and Russia do in this juncture. The odd man out in this case is Japan, which is, has fair proximity with the Koreas, but at the same time has been fairly hawkish, shall we say, about North Korea and more with the United States. So I think we'll have to see how the post calling off of the summit pans out with the four powers, four countries we talked about, Russia, China, and they're not marginal countries, they're really powerful countries, and North and South Korea, how all of this pan out. So I'm hopeful it will not mean a return to the kind of near war scenario we had before the North and South Korean presidents had met. But nevertheless, it is a situation which is fraught with risks for, for the Koreas.